Great. All right. Good morning, everyone. I think we'll get started now. My name is Shireen Darinani, and I am the Special Events and Protocol Officer in the Office of the President. Welcome to the second session of the main event. Today's webinar will focus on the migration of in-person activities to online and how to make them both successful and valuable. I want to thank Daria Dambazzi from the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and Barbara Track from Woodsworth College for inviting me to moderate today's session. Before I introduce our speakers, a few housekeeping logistics. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be shared in the days following the event. First, we will hear from each of our speakers before we move on to a question and answer period. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the session using the built-in Q&A feature. I wish to start the session with acknowledging this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And now, I would like to introduce our wonderful panelists before I turn it over to them. Jillian Matherin is, is the Director of Strategic Communications and Public Engagement at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. She joined U of T nearly two years ago and has spent the last 15 years working in nonprofit communications and advocacy. Emily Pimblett is the Director of Advancement Events in the Division of University Advancement and leads a team of event professionals. They produce best in-class experiences for alumni and donors to support the university's goals, both locally and globally. She has over 15 years experience designing and executing strategic events for large organizations. Nadia Rosemond is the Assistant Dean, Co-Curricular Programs and Student Leadership from the Office of Student Experience and Wellbeing at the University of Toronto Scarborough. In her current role, Nadia oversees strategic development and implementation of co-curricular programs and international student services. Now, each of you has extensive experience in the planning and execution of events with very different purposes and audiences, so thank you so much for joining us today. It's been really heartening to see the sheer number of events that have necessarily transitioned to online platforms during this period of global upheaval. For example, I'm not sure how many in our audience tuned into the virtual convocation ceremony last week. If you haven't, I strongly encourage you to do so, and you can find it on the university's YouTube channel. It was so impactful to see the massive size of the audience that tuned in to watch. More importantly, the range of comments in the live chat box all throughout the ceremony and the celebration seen on social media channels following. It's really a fantastic example of an event that's typically 30 plus in-person ceremonies transitioning to a single online ceremony that was to reach 15,000 graduates and their loved ones. It's really reminded of what a wonderful community we see at the university across the campuses. Now with that in mind, I'd like to turn it over to Emily. Emily, we've worked together for a number of years and I've witnessed firsthand various alumni and donor events that your team has executed. How have you transitioned to online events? Thank you, Shireen. Sorry, I'm just gonna get my slides up here. Just a second. All right. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for the introduction, Shereen. Um, as Shereen mentioned, I, uh, I work in advancement events with a team of really awesome event professionals. Uh, and like everyone, we're, we're trying to figure out how to reframe the way we think and how to move live events uh, to online engagements. Uh, when the pandemic first started, at first, we all went home and just kind of waited to see what was going to happen. I was slightly in denial uh, and didn't really know how to move forward. Um, and then we got the sense this really wasn't going anywhere. Um, so we started canceling events. Um, we were busy. We were contacting vendors, negotiating contracts that were already in place, uh, reconciling budgets, notifying event attendees. And once we canceled what we needed to, we were really in a holding pattern and it was, it was kind of scary. Um, our team operates a bit like an agency model and we rely on program managers for the content uh, who are also dealing with their own questions and uncertainty. Um, you know, when is the right time to start engaging with alumni and donors again? For a while we were just kind of waiting to see what was going to happen. Somewhat frozen, our team was overcome by so many questions. 
when can we do live events again? Should we start planning for September? Oh, September doesn't seem realistic anymore. Will there ever be large live events again? What about regional events? Can we travel? What does this mean for our jobs? Um, so we took the time to really learn as much as much as we could and are continuing to still learn. Since we really couldn't answer any of these questions, we started researching different online platforms and attending as many online events as possible to get as much experience as we could. So we started reaching out to partners on campus to gather information, to figure out the next steps and figure out where we could provide value. Then I realized we really just needed to offer the same, the same service that we were previously offering, which is executing event logistics. And although it's a different experience, the fundamentals of putting together an in-person event and an online event are similar. But before I dive into replicating live events online, um, there are a few questions we need to consider. Do all events actually need to migrate to virtual? Um, we really need to rely on the fundamentals of an event more than ever. It's probably more important, more important than ever to understand the purpose of why we are doing events and if it makes sense to even move it online. Online events have limitations that in-person events don't have where in-person events can draw attendees with a unique venue or networking, online events are, really have to rely on the content. So just because we were originally planning to host an event in person does not mean that the events need to be replicated online. That's why the objective is so important. So what are you trying to achieve? Is it that you're bringing faculty research to your audience, uh, career development content? Is it stewardship focused? Is it a celebration with a large number of guests? Then you need to think through who you want to engage um, and what is that experience going to be like. So first find out if your objective truly is best achieved with an online event. It may not. For example, you can get creative with non-event online engagement. There are ways like using social media, running contests or campaigns. Our annual giving team within advancement hosts a garden party for donors every year. And it has a hat and tie contest. It's a long-standing tradition. Um, and rather than trying to replicate the event, they've moved the contest to social media and people have to submit their pictures wearing, wearing their hat or tie. Before committing to a platform, it, it's really important to think about the format. If online event engage, engagement seems to be the right path, then you can figure out how you're going to do it and what the format will be. It could be interactive, it could be a formal presentation with the presenter, the Q&A, maybe some of it's pre-recorded, um, be collaborative sessions, maybe panel discussions, be large gatherings with breakouts into smaller groups. The guest experience or participant experience, we can call it now, it still matters. So like we do in live events, it's important to think through what the experience will be for not only the participants, but for the presenters. Do you want people to be able to interact with each other? Should they be able to ask questions? Do they need to vote? Is your speaker equipped to present from home? With live events, you have to rely on your imagination. A bonus of online events is you can do rehearsals and experience the event before it happens. Walk through the event from start to finish, from the first email and then clicking to sign up, and then clicking to sign in for the event. As I mentioned earlier, while events don't require food and beverage or venues, they're made of many of the same elements as any other kind of event. Some of the elements of an online event are um, promotion. Is there an event website? How do you, people find out about this event? How are they invited? How do they sign up and register? How do they log in when it's go time? How will the content be presented? Is there a captioning or a simultaneous translation? How will people ask questions and how will questions be managed on the back end? Is there live polling? How will that work? Again, how is it managed, to, uh, managed on the back end? Surveys, will you send one? How easy is it for the users to use? Put yourself in the participant's shoes and then the presenters in the presenter's shoes as well and think through each step. Once you figured out what the experience what you want the experience to be, then you can think through the new methods of delivery, which is what platform are you going to use? 
we found, I found it very overwhelming. Um, and then quickly realized you really don't need to be overwhelmed. And there's so many resources and partners on and off campus that have more expertise in the online world than at least I do and probably most of us. So don't be afraid to engage and figure out what the options are. Nobody is expecting that you become an online expert overnight. I've included a link here that outlines uh, the platforms available to us, um, as well as academic and campus events, ACE um, is a great resource. They have done a tremendous job moving online and it can talk you through some of the options, especially with, um, with MS Live, which is what they're managing. We've also worked with bespoke audiovisual, especially when it comes to doing any pre-recordings or stitching videos together. They are platform agnostic, so this helps when you're looking for something with a bit more functionality. Um, they can choose from a variety of platforms that you won't see on this list. They have a studio you can actually go to, uh, and you can film your speakers there to avoid any glitches. They practice physical distan distancing, um, so it makes for a pretty safe place to do so. They're also a vendor of records, so there's no need for multiple quotes. Um, of course, you can say things like, you know, I can run, use, a, use Zoom or run a webinar, so I'll just do it myself. And that's absolutely fine for some things. But for some, especially the bigger ones, um, it may be worth just to get some extra help. Think of it when you're at a live event. You wouldn't be standing behind a tech table managing the microphones or the screen content. Um, and I think the, aver the advantage of partnering with, with ACE or a company like Bespoke or any of the audiovisual experts across campus, that you really get their, their expertise. And they've been busy running online events for different departments or companies and learn what has worked and what hasn't. They can suggest branding opportunities, offer virtual technical support. They'll also be on top of all of the new um, features every few weeks. For example, MS Teams has increased the number of people you can see at once, which is great for meetings where you need to interact. I believe there's another session dedicated just to platforms, so I will just leave it at that for now. Um, okay. This is, um, it's a whole new world. We'll, I think we really need to experiment in order to get it right. There is so much uncertainty, unpredictability, screen fatigue, tech challenges, and tech changes. So I think this needs to be a continuous process of iteration. Nobody has a crystal ball here. Um, I think this is a time where we can really take on the spirit of experimentation because costs are low. We don't have to pay for venues, food and beverage, decor, etc. Don't be afraid to spend a bit on technology or the experience to get it right and to improve the experience for not only your guests, but for speakers and for yourself as a planner. Be open, share experiences with other teams. Experimenting works best when you have more data. Um, and I think it's worth investigating our time in really learning and getting comfortable with online events. This could be how we do things for a while. And even when we do start, hopefully, <laughs> start to do live events again, it's unlikely that online events will entirely go away. Um, it could be a new world and we're getting more and more comfortable communicating online with each passing week. We are realizing how many more people we can reach and how much more we can do. I promise this is my final point. Um, Hosting an online event requires the same care and attention as in person. So with both events, you need to effectively promote the event, engage your attendees, create memorable moments for attendees, and prove event success. By thinking of online events, not as small one-off presentations, but as value-added, engagement-driven experiences, you can create an impactful event that exceeds well beyond a computer screen. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. That was fantastic. You've really raised some key questions for us to consider in planning online events just before and during the, the planning of them. Um, as a reminder to everyone, Daria's also already mentioned this in the uh, chat box, but please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. Now I'd like to turn the session over to Nadia. Nadia, tell us about your engagement with the new norm of virtual events. Thank you. I hope you did uh, see my screen. So these are just a few things that are 
uh, on my mind things that I'm thinking about as my team and I move towards online engagement and uh, conversations that I'm having across my campus as well with as with colleagues at uh, the university. So I'm thinking about students as partners, uh, the importance of collaboration across a team and across the campus, and making sure that I prioritize inclusive design. Uh, thinking of students as partners, oftentimes for some of us, students are our audience. So um, making sure that we make time as we plan our sessions and our events that the student voice is still present. So this could be in the form of your work study staff, student staff volunteers, or previous participants from your programming to so just include them in the planning process, maybe part of your rehearsal for your event to provide input on the flow. Uh, input if it's relevant, if it's too boring, if there's lag time and so on, if it was easy to navigate, uh, making sure that they have that buy-in from the beginning so that when you present for students, um, it resonates with them. Thinking when possible, students as co-facilitators or presenters, so um, trying to provide that peer-to-peer -peer energy. Um, students could help maybe with breakout rooms. Uh, students could be a host of your event. Uh, just recently, we had a student recognition for one of our community engagement programs, the Amani Academic Mentorship Program. And our students were the co-hosts of the award ceremony. And they called the mentees at home, like, throughout the event to break up, you know, the, the viewing part and had, like, skill testing questions for uh, families and mentees to win prizes. So uh, knowing that people are watching and, like, bring them in in other ways to kind of keep them engaged. Uh, when possible, using uh, popular platforms to either promote or tie in engagement with your event. So the use of hashtags, um, we saw the success of that for convocation last week, uh, promoting through Instagram, maybe continuing this discussion or um, beginning the discussion for your event through Instagram. TikTok's very popular uh, and YouTube is always a um, successful resource as well. And then as much as possible, uh, trying to accommodate the student's schedule. So um, when the school year does begin, students are gonna be, it's hard to imagine them at home with back-to-back -back classes, but they will face that reality. So making sure that we record our events so they could be viewed at a later time by students. Also, one of the things that I saw successful by watching other events that have passed, Convocation had a really good use of a social wall. So having people share images and posts as they experience the event together. And then at our campus, um, our principal, uh, director of um, alumni relations and our academic uh, dean of academics, they had a send off video um, that had a really great reception from students. So it was kind of personalizing convocation with having like a personal message from our campus for students graduating. So I think we're seeing um, for online engagement, the before and after is even more important than before, right? So things that kind of lead up to your event and get the anticipation going, and things after your event that kind of help people share, like, I felt this way during it, or I like this moment, um, to kind of make sure that it's not escaped as a one time uh, going online together for an hour. Collaboration across your team and campus. So not to disregard, I know that in a lot of our units, we do tons of collaboration with, with people already, but I think the online engagements increase this even more. Um, so some ideas I'm thinking about is like seeking a variety of presenters where possible. So don't forget that certain people across our campus or institution that have skills in, for example, you could do a physical body break for a longer event by inviting maybe your athletics team or move you. Uh, utilizing your leadership development coordinators, student life coordinators that have uh, facilitated a team builder for your team session or for your event. So it's not just you, maybe, or you have the same face being speaking to the audience. There's a variety of voices present to kind of break up the event. Uh, what IT platforms experts exist around you, including IITS? So there's a really nice variety of U of T supported platforms. Uh, utilizing them as much as possible because ITS will support us through them. But also, um, your peers have been using these platforms for quite some time. Uh, some of them have survived Zoom bombings and navigated those things. So making sure we like create time to check in with each other with like best practices, what works, and sharing tips with each other is really important 
like ongoing. Uh, leaning on your team. So oftentimes we are quick to like program our own events and design our own events. Uh, but I think when it comes to online events, you actually need your team members to support you, handle behind the scenes, the Q&A, the signs. And so it's not as, um, planning an event is not as singular as it used to be. So making sure that you lean on your team, uh, you don't double plan on top of each other, that you're working together to support each event behind the scenes and in front of the camera. And lastly, just to point out, like, don't hesitate to reach out to offices on campus for additional programming ideas. There's a number of videos that already exist that um, could act as um, a, a video that plays in the waiting room or in your breakout rooms as people wait for the event to start. Um, there, could, there are other groups across campus that are looking to develop stuff and videos that you can maybe join in and co-create. So what already exists in the sense of maybe a YouTube video or um, presentation or something that you could use to like incorporate in your event. And across U of T, there are communities of practice uh, ranging from topics of academics, inclusive design, um, EDI, student leadership. So um, on my last slide, I'll have my email, but if you're interested in maybe joining one of them, uh, these communities are just make, make made up of staff and, and coordinated across each campus just working together, sharing what they know, um, and trying to prepare for the right now and also for the fall. Lastly, I'm a little concerned and I really want to make sure that we don't lose sight of this is making sure that what we create and design is inclusive. So uh, involving your local accessibility office to make sure what you create and design is accessible, being aware of maybe different platforms so that whatever we create is um, accessible for that platform. Um, CAP, it's an acronym I have for Cognitive, Effective, and Psychomotor, like the three uh, learning styles. So where possible, as you design your events, thinking about how you um, connect to someone's mind, get them thinking, get them, get them feeling, and then from where they are located, get them writing or physically doing something to kind of feel that they're a part of the event, but also trying to um, connect to their different ways of learning. Making sure we bring back land acknowledgements and personalize them. So yes, we could use a U of T one, but some of us are located across the city. We're in cottage country or like maybe in another province looking from home. That adds a variety of land acknowledgements based on where we're located. So um, it, it could be really exciting and very powerful and very um, an act of gratitude to kind of recognize where we are, that we're like across the city, across the province, uh, how we interact with the land, how we interact with our space now that we're not us together, but we are united by, you know, being aware of that we're on this land. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure that we keep remembering that um, this was easier at an event to have like, you know, that slide or have that little cue card, uh, but online sometimes we're quick to like start things and, and get things started. So making sure we take those moments to like recognize where we're located. And lastly, just seeking input from offices like our Equity Diversity Office, SQDO, um, just making sure that um, as we plan events, we maybe approach them ahead of time as best as possible to get their buy-in, get their feedback, uh, get their input to make sure that what we're designing is inclusive, accessible, and welcoming to all the students versus uh, presenting and unfortunately maybe receiving a student or staff complaint because they felt excluded or not included by our events. So making sure that we get that support from people across the campus. We remember theme month, so like this month is an amazing display your pride is coming up. It's also like Indigenous Peoples Days on um, June 21st. So different things that if we were on campus, it would be easier to visually see and remember and be like, oh yeah, it's this theme week. It might be a little bit harder as the months go along, but being mindful of what are ways that we can incorporate and acknowledge those days, those weeks, um, those months within the things that we do to just make students and staff feel included and seen um, in our events. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Nadia. Um, it's really key to think about your audience making the events convenient and accessible for all of them. And as you've mentioned, online engagement is really such an integral part of planning in these in when we're looking at virtual events now. 
Uh, and thank you for mentioning that list of available resources. You're tying in really well with our first webinar that was about accessibility, um, which I also encourage our audience to, to take a look at if they haven't already seen. So thank you very much. Now over to Jill. Um, last but not least, what's your experience been with events in the virtual sphere? Sure. Thanks so much, Shireen. And thank you, uh, Emily and Nadia. I feel like there are a lot of things I'll take away from your presentations and, and we can discuss with our team and implement after. I really appreciate this. So um, at the Monk School, I think the COVID-19 has presented us with an unexpected opportunity. We obviously host many events throughout the year, um, both internal events for the school within the university and then also external clients uh, at our facilities. And our team, so Daria, who's on this call, Adam, who's behind the scenes on this call as well, and we will be presenting on Zoom um, in an upcoming event, and Stacy, they've all been working um, really, really quickly to sort of pivot uh, and, and move our events online. Some of them out of necessity, because we had programs like the Global Ideas Institute, where we had um, 250 students from 25 GTA high schools who were doing this sort of year-long program, and we had to quickly pivot to online programming. And so Adam had experience kind of doing breakout rooms and changing their symposium online within the first two weeks of, of being home. Um, so I think, you know, some of those things we had to pivot out of necessity. And then some of them, we just wanted to keep the conversations going, particularly at this moment, um, and didn't want to miss the opportunity. So one of the things that's been really interesting for us, and I'll get into some, some tips in a second, but um, moving to online events has allowed us to really expand our reach. We've been able to have greater numbers of people at our events than we can fit in our spaces. Many of our events have had hundreds of people, whereas we might only have had you know, 120 in the actual, in our Campbell Conference facility, or if we'd had it in the larger venue. So more people, the number of actual registrants who are attending is significantly higher. We're having about a 70% attendance rate of registered attendees, which is quite high for us. Um, and I think, you know, we're also having different kinds of audience members attend. A lot of people can't necessarily make it to the physical spaces, but we're finding we're getting sort of more people in private sector, more people from other institutions, from government journalists who are tuning in. And I think it's just allowing us to expand our base in a way that we hadn't entirely anticipated. Many of them are tuning in from other countries. It's not unusual for us to have sort of people tune in from 15 to 20 countries for each online event. Um, so that's been a really beneficial aspect of, of this whole process. And I think um, it's even helped. I know a lot of us are right now worried about melt of, of sort of students over the summer and making sure that they're attending in the fall. So it's actually been an opportunity as well to engage incoming students in our events. We've had a few exclusive events for students. We had a conversation with uh, Michael Sabia, our director and the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Francois Philippe Champagne, and we're able to invite our current students, graduating students, some alumni, but also our incoming class. And um, we had quite a number of students attend. So I mean, it's it's been a nice way to engage people uh, who are who are from afar. So that's been great. So I think Adam, if you wouldn't mind moving to the the first slide, I'll have sort of some top ten tips uh, that we've enlisted as we've moved to virtual events. Um, the first thing really is watch what others are doing. We moved pretty quickly online, but obviously we, you know, many others were doing online events. So we, our, our events team during that uh, early period and even still, uh, regularly watch other, other events to sort of see what's working, what, you know, what do we like about the length, what, what isn't working, how is the Q&A functioning for different pieces. We decided that for many of our public events, we would disable the chat feature and, and stream questions through the Q&A because we found it a little tricky. For an event like this, where it's sort of internal stakeholders, I think it's a little easier than perhaps some public events. Um, we decided we wanted people on camera instead of just a call. Uh, we, you know, worked with framing of how people were framed and, and audio and things like that. And so, you know, seeing what others are doing, trying to get a sense of the kinds of events that people are holding, the length, um, the idea of you know finding moderators who can keep the conversation going and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second i think normally our events tended to be a little longer around sort of an hour and a half and we would be on the sort of u of t 10 minutes after the hour start time we've changed that and sort of start right on time keep it to an hour or, or less if possible and i think those things have been have been great and then also as nadia was mentioning trying to incorporate engagement into different events we've done some some polling and things like that in some of them but obviously we have we can try other things and I think that's really exciting. 
Um, number nine, I won't spend too much time on, but I think uh, because Emily was talking about it a little bit, but deciding on your platform. For us, Zoom was the natural choice because we already were using it for um, some of our classes. We had the Global Journalism Program at Dalalana that we were running out of Monk, and so we had a lot of comfort with Zoom. Um, but, I, you know, others within the school, so Citizen Lab notably is using Instagram Live regularly, weekly to, to disseminate their research and have conversations between the school's director and, and different researchers to kind of really drill down in, into, the, into the issues. And I think that's a great platform for them. Doesn't require a lot of, you know, behind the scenes and it's, it's fairly easy to launch. For us, I think Zoom makes a lot of sense and we have a 1000 person webinar platform. So that's working out pretty well for us. We've also been working, um, I mean, we have the webinar platform, but we also do things like we ran a number of end of year gatherings last week. So Adam, you know, worked with the program teams to put together these gatherings for students post convocation that felt really human, right? Like where it's, they were sharing slideshows and people had the chance to talk to one another. And it was kind of like a class, a lot of people on at a time, but trying to really choreograph it in a way that, you know, felt like it was a celebration, but also making sure that it kind of ran on, on time. And so using Zoom in different ways for that too. And I know he'll talk more about that when he does his presentation. Um, number eight, one thing that we found really helpful, particularly in the early phases, was to do a test run. And I can't remember whether Nadia or Emily mentioned this, but I think, you know, we, we try out the platform and we each take turns taking roles. So we have someone do AV and someone behind the scenes handling questions. And, you know, we assign a grumpy commentator to try and, you know, ask troubling questions and how the panelists will handle it and things like that and try to, you know, test out whether what, what happens if audio doesn't work and, and just basically do a mock event and, and run the slides. And I found that that was really a useful practice for us and we've done it a few times and I think has really helped things uh, go smoothly. Another little tip is just to start as we did with this event about 20 minutes early to make sure everyone's on the platform because sometimes the last minute technical difficulties crop up and that's really uh, sometimes a challenge. Number seven is uh, partnering with others. One thing we found really helpful is including others in the mix, have broadening our audience and, and sharing the resources in terms of promotion and also just building uh, the event. So I put TIFF up here. We, we have for the last eight years worked with the Toronto International Film Festival on a speaker series and we are actually going to be doing that again this year, probably online. So we're still figuring out exactly how that will work, but um, that's something that we'll do. We also did an event recently with Foreign Policy Magazine on their Zoom platform. Um, but collaborating with them, we're working with CIFAR and others, and then schools within university, with, within U of T. So we have an event next week with School of Cities and Massey College. And it's just an opportunity to expand, expand the audience and just kind of tap into different, different stakeholders across the campus. Um, one thing I'll mention too is that, uh, so sorry, number six, if Adam, if you can go to that one, choosing speakers. So some of the events our team has organized from the ground up and some of them have been brought to us by faculty. And I think in, in each case, we're working to sort of find speakers who are comfortable speaking online. I know everyone's had to move quickly to holding classes online, but some are more comfortable than others speaking in sound bites. Um, going to our faculty that are comfortable doing media has been a, a helpful resource for that because often people who are capable of, of doing media interviews are, are usually pretty comfortable in this platform. Similarly, um, moderators, finding moderators who are, are really good at kind of keeping the conversation going is helpful. We've been turning recently to journalists quite often to do this, and particularly broadcasters. So one of our first events we did on um, trust and politics and COVID, um, and Adrienne Harry on our team, that was her sort of brainchild, and I think it was a really great idea. We had uh, Peter Mansbridge, one of our fellows, hosted, and then we had Peter Lowen and Lynette Ong, um, who are affiliated with Monk and then David Fisman from Dalalana. Uh, and it was a really great event. We had excellent feedback. And I think one of the real strengths was that it was, you know, there was a mix of disciplines an epidemiologist and political scientist, and then a broadcaster. And the conversation moved quickly. It was an hour, it felt short. I think that was great. The next, the next one we did also, we had, you know, Anna Maria Tremonti and we have uh, Marcia Young coming up from CBC World Report to do ours next week. So, I mean, I think having broadcasters and journalists is great. They're inquisitive, they ask great questions and they keep the conversation flowing. Tureen, if I'm taking too long, you can flag me down. I'm sorry. Um, number five, really quickly, just uh, know your audience. So basically, we have been using Zoom, and one of the benefits of Zoom is that you can collect information on people by asking them to fill out uh, required fields. So before the event, you can let your 
speakers know who's actually going to be on the call or who's likely to be on the call so they can tailor the remarks a bit more. And I think that's been really useful. Um, you know, you don't obviously pass on con you know, contact information for these people, but you give a sense, you know, it's people tuning in from this many countries, from these kinds of institutions, these are the questions they may have. Um, we often ask people to submit questions in advance. Sometimes we get them and sometimes we don't. The majority we get on our platforms, but I think it's useful to, to, um, to try that piece. And then the other thing uh, we'll talk about later is just sort of retaining that audience, particularly if you have partners and you want to make sure that those people are tuning in to your, to your events uh, later on. Um, number four is if you're not already, create an event brief. So have a document where you have all the relevant information for your event that you can share with all of your panelists. So the purpose of the event, the run order, the correct titles for everyone and bios in one place, areas of expertise, potential questions and who they'd be directed to and possible intro and outro. This is especially important if you have external moderators, because I think just the level of comfort in terms of making sure that they, that they have a grasp of what they're being asked to do is really helpful. Um, Again, decide how you'll handle questions in advance and who will do them. So on this platform, Daria is behind the scenes looking at the questions as they come in and we'll feed them to Shireen. And that's something that we often do in our, in our events as well. Um, number three, promoting your event. So, you know, figuring out your desired audience, where they are and finding the right ways to reach them, um, whether it's having targeted email lists, which we have uh, several for different sectors. Um, we also promote on social and different audiences on each platform. If you don't have a big budget to design posters and, and pieces like that, I'd, I'd really encourage you to try Canva um, and use photos from Unsplash and Canva Pro. You can brand everything and it's, you know, quickly create and resize posts. And I think that's really helpful. Make sure you're tagging the panelists in your, in your posts and uh, writing to other stakeholders and asking them to share uh, news of the event. We also use the newsletter, our newsletter as sort of a major tool for getting things out. But for some things like this event coming up on COVID and cities on the 16th, um, we you know, advertised in Blogtio and Now and other places as well to try to ex expand the reach. Um, number two, collecting information. So oh, sorry, encouraging signups to your channel. So at the end of your event, if you can, as much as possible, encourage people to follow you if they're not already. Since uh, April, we have doubled our number of YouTube subscribers and uh, we're trying to increase our newsletter signups, particularly for event signups. So just remind people both sort of at the end of the event and in the follow up email that they can sign up if they haven't already. Um, and then I would say also as a follow up, if you can, um, if you can export the information about who, you know, the kinds of audience that, are, that was on the call, how many people at the peak time. Um, and you know where they're coming from and, and some select uh, highlights of, of who was there. Share that with the panelists at the end. I think it's encouraging for people to know who was tuning in and um, can be a great resource. And then the final thing I would say is uh, make sure to continue to promote, promote your event after it's over. The real benefit in my mind of online events is that it, they have a life much beyond, uh, beyond the actual event itself. Some of our events have had two or three times the initial audience um, just on YouTube alone. And so I would say make sure that you're, you're sharing after the fact, you're sending an email follow up with the link, you're sharing on social, you're putting in your newsletter, you're drawing people to it um, well after the fact. And I think it's also been a great recruitment tool for moderators, particularly ones who aren't part of the school. So getting other journalists to want to come and moderate for us, it's been great to be able to show them Peter Mansbridge and Anna Maria Tremonti and, and others. So um, I'll stop there because I'm taking way too much time, but thanks so much and look forward to questions. Fantastic. Thanks, Jill. That actually wasn't too much over time, so you're pretty good at <laughs> timing yourself. Um, that was some really great positive news that you shared about virtual events. You're absolutely right. You can, we can have a larger audience. We're not confined by venue capacities, um, you know, making necessary adjustments to the event, the event format. I think across all three of our presentations today, you've really seen some shared themes about taking advantage of resources or partnerships that are out there that um, can really help uh, the engagement level for virtual events. Um, and really think about the best ways to engage your, your audience. So absolutely fantastic. Thank you to all three of our panelists. Uh, to our audience, thank you to those who submitted our questions so far. We have about 20 minutes left, um, so we'll take the questions from there. Please do continue to submit them. We have a wealth of experience here on the virtual stage. So I'll start us off with our, our first question. Um, 
uh, I don't know, Nadia, if you want to take this one or if anyone wants to jump in. Um, but the first question is, somebody's wondering about panelists' thoughts on online awards. Person says, I'm not sure if an online award ceremony can be engaging and worthwhile. Yeah, sure, I could start. Um, I think it's possible, I guess, based on our, our student awards for our uh, Amani program, uh, we did a mixture of pre-recorded um, videos and live. So pre-recorded videos, I guess similar to the Oscars where you kind of pre-record maybe who has already won uh, their speech or their moment. Um, and then the live parts might be your MC or host uh, announcing things and like keeping flow of the actual event and, and the timeline. So I think it's worthwhile. We saw convocation. I think the students um, are concerned about missing out on those moments now that we're not together. And I think there's a value to kind of, as much as possible, to salvage some sort of awards reception spirit virtually. And it won't be the same, but I think uh, students, even ourselves, we still appreciate being acknowledged and having a celebration, whatever it might look like. So I'm pro uh, doing what you can. I know our athletics department also did their um, banquet and awards, I think, through YouTube and through Facebook and Instagram announcing the winners. So um, I think there's, it's not the same, but recognition is still important. Absolutely. Thank you. Jill, Emily, do you want to jump in at all? I think I'd just echo what Nadia said. We sort of used, at our end of year gatherings last year, we sort of did a little bit of student recognition where it was, you know, in, in that context, throwing up a slide with the award and then giving, throwing to the student for a moment to sort of speak um, so that it felt like they had a chance to acknowledge it, I think was a nice touch. We also have an award ceremony that we had to put online fairly quickly. We do a book prize for the best international affairs book. And that one we partnered with Foreign Policy Magazine because the ceremony we normally do didn't quite work out um, and so what we did instead was just a talk where we talked about the prize and didn't didn't hold it. I recognize that's not the same as student awards um, but it did require a pretty significant rejigging of the way we would normally hold a, a ceremony. We essentially didn't do the ceremony. That's great, thank you. Um, I think I'll just add quickly if that's okay. Just I think it also depends on how many how many award recipients there are. Um, if there's a few, I think you, you can find a way to, to make it meaningful online. But if there's a lot, I mean, with convocation, you're not going to read out 15,000 names. Um, we have an award ceremony. Um, Melanie, I think you may have been the one that asked this question and we'll be working on this together. Uh, but in the fall, I'm just trying to figure out how we will acknowledge you know, anywhere from 100 to 200 people, it's, you really can't read out all their names. And so having to get creative or, um, and doing it virtually, or maybe waiting until in person is possible. So. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll post this to either, uh, I mean, any one of you can answer this, but I'll, I'll go ahead and target one of you. Um, Jill, has anyone went into delays uh, posting recorded events because of closed captioning? So I think I'd probably let Adam answer that one, um, but generally we post within a day or so. We immediately get them captioned by rev.com after we record and then try to post. Usually they're, they're pretty quick with their turnaround and much more, having used a bunch of different services in the past, they're certainly the fastest. Um, and so I think you, you upload the video file as soon as you have it and then they send you an SRT file that you can, you can add to the caption. It's usually very quick. And so generally we're posting a day later. Fantastic. But we, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, I was going to say it is possible with Zoom, for example, to live stream your event to YouTube immediately. But we we choose generally not to do that unless we have huge overflow, and rather, you know, we'll actually like edit the event slightly and just kind of put in new slot, like you know, an intro, intro slide and and caption it, and then we'll post the next day. So, all right, someone's just asked, could you? What was the company again that does the captions that you mentioned? It's called Rev.com. R-E-V.com. They're really good. Um, Nadia, Emily, any any issues with uh, delays in, uh, in in transcripting and doing the closed captioning? We haven't actually um, we haven't done it yet. We're looking into it, so I um, <laughs> I don't have anything else to add at this point. Same. Great. 
Um, I mean, I know uh, Microsoft Teams, if you're using that, which may or may not be the best platform, depending on the, on the event, it has an auto captioning uh, yeah. function that's available that you can take advantage of. Um, it's not necessarily the most accurate, so it does require proofing, but it's available and it's, it's quite fast as well. YouTube also has an auto capture feature just to jump in, but same thing, it's not super accurate, so that's why we've aired on the service. Absolutely. Um, let's see, uh, I'll, I'll throw this out to the group. Are there any resources available for running a social wall online? Anything that you've come across so far? And I'll, I mean, I'll really write as well, we are all learning together as we <laughs> Um, these, these virtual events we're putting on more and more of them. We're all engaging more with this platform. So, um, but if there's anything that you, you can think of. So we've started using one called Kudo Board. Uh, there's a slight fee involved. It's K-U-D-O and then the word board. Um, we've used it for, for our sort of end of year gatherings for our programs or for, you know, celebrations and everyone can post an event. You can post a photo or a GIF and it's just kind of this one link where you see sort of a wall of messages. Um, there is a slight fee, but that's the one we've been using. Great. Um, is there a list of who to contact for these videos or communities of practice? I know, Nadia, your presentation, you mentioned um, specific offices, and we have another question where someone's asked you to just uh, explain the, the abbreviations for the EDI, SGDO, and uh, ARCDO. Sure. So the first part, the communities of practice, they're like tri-campus working groups um, themed under academics, student leadership, a whole bunch of themes, uh, holistic learning, um, and they're just made up of staff across all three campuses working together and meeting probably bi-weekly um, to make sure that we're able to kind of continue our co-curricular engagement online. So if you email me, I'll be sure to connect you uh, to a community of practice that might suit your, um, your need. And as for the acronyms, so um, EDI is the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Office. Um, SGDO is the Sexual Gender Diversity Office. Um, ARCDO is the Anti-Racism um, and Diversity Office. And Accessibility Offices at your respective campus. Oh, I also want to give a shout out to um, maybe even including some of your international student centers. So making sure that um, what we design is intercultural, inclusive of all types of um, students, not only, I think, for example, uh, when we were doing our event planning online, some of us were quick to think about like uh, having like little pub trivia nights or quiz nights. And then people on my team saying that is not as hip or trendy for people in other parts of the world. Can you explain what that is and why that's you know, cool and fun? So being mindful as we design things, we can sure that we have that intercultural lens as well. If I could just add to, to the international experience, um, changing the timing of events. We've done a lot of events sort of around this time, but I think in order to include a greater number of people, we've moved a lot of them to the afternoon. Also to like afternoon so that you can include West Coast, but not so late that you aren't including people in other time zones. So I think, you know, we've been playing around with that a little bit, depending on the event. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Next question, can the panel address different ways of collecting feedback from attendees? Anybody can jump in. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, there's one thing, I don't know if people have, I hope I say it right. It's like, I think it's called like Mentimeter, menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And it's a way that you can kind of um, set up your questions you show the code to, um, to your audience. They use their phone or maybe another screen and they can respond and like type in questions. Um, so you could have that for maybe an assessment following your event or you use it as a way to engage your audience during your event. That, that kind of ties into the cycle of touching and the thinking like, because um, some people may not be, might still be shy to do the chat and attach their name to what they want to ask or say. Uh, so Mentimeter or menti.com adds that little bit of an anon anonymous to it. So that could be one way to capture feedback at the end of your event. 
Absolutely, I've heard of that as well. I mean, there's also built-in surveys that you can send around, whether it's uh, you can share it as a resource during the presentation or the, the session, whatever it is. Uh, you can also email your attendees after the fact um, and ask them to fill out a survey there. I know that, again, my experience, I'll say, uh, has been a lot with primarily with Microsoft, so there are the built-in survey features there. Um, don't know if, Jill, Emily, anything that you can want to add in? We typically use um, Survey Gizmo after after events to collect feedback. That's our go-to. Great. These are some great suggestions. We also just use sort of old school email. <laughs> we have an event yeah. and get a lot of feedback. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, I know there have been some questions about asking for resources. Uh, Jill, this one's for you about online resources for photo images to use in Canva posters. Um, you can mention it here, but I'll also reiterate to our audience that we'll, we are going to be sending around the slides after the fact, and so you'll have all of our panelists' contact information, and you'll have some of the, the resources there to, as a, to follow up with. Sure, and I'm a bit of a Canva evangelist, so feel free to contact me about that. <laughs> but the, um, So we use Canva, and you can get Canva Pro for $13 a month. Um, and it allows you access to a wide range of photos. You can also embed YouTube videos and create a variety of posts. So happy to talk to anybody about that. We also use Unsplash, which is royalty-free photos, and there are a lot of great ones. Um, you, they're free with attribution for the most part. And then I'd also just encourage you, if you're interested, um, U of T communications professionals, we have, we have an, a, day, a day as well called Field Day. We've opted to hold an in-person event in 2021, and I'm co-chairing it um, for the next one or for this upcoming one. So um, if you want to learn more about resources there also, please feel free to sign up for that one. <laughs> Excellent plug. <laughs> um, <laughs> this one's also for you, Jill. Uh, it's about the uh, attendee, collecting attendee information through Zoom. Sure, and I'm happy to let others jump in as well, and particularly, you know, Daria and Adam, if I know you're behind the scenes, but feel free to jump in. We, we've, so it's, you know, we don't want to make it so much of a barrier to registering that we add a ton of fields, but gen fields, but generally we're trying to collect information like job title and organization, and then where people are dialing in from. So we make those mandatory, which is, you know, sometimes people just leave it, you know, put a letter, but for the most part, people fill in what their titles are, and it's giving us far more information about where people are coming from and what their sector is. Mm -hmm. um, than we were able to collect in the past. And so, and I think just the, the location information has been invaluable as well. So we do have email addresses, but we, we're not sort of spamming people. Obviously we respect GDPR regulations and we're not gonna add people to our list without their consent, but we do after the fact reach out and, and ask people if they'd like to join our list. Fantastic. This is for, uh, for everyone. Any tips for coping with or avoiding virtual event fatigue? Uh, this person, the says, I've heard many folks say it's becoming too much and difficult to stay engaged. And I think this is something, um, I think it was you, Jill, who talked about this in your presentation about taking an event that might originally have been 90 minutes um, and shortening it because you're out, everyone, it's absolutely right that there is virtual event fatigue, there's virtual meeting fatigue. Any, um, any other tips that anyone wants to add? Sorry, go ahead, Nadia. I feel like I'm jumping in way too much. <laughs> no, uh, I, like, I like the idea of maybe some things where possible becoming maybe podcasts or things that people could listen in and like they could leave and walk and uh, not have to be at a screen. So where possible, something could be um, audio based um, or I don't know where possible, something could be a little bit interactive. I know um, athletics has had things that are kind of like virtual scavenger hunts and people have a map and they're encouraged to go to different spots on campus so I know that doesn't translate for all events but um, like I think for, for me I'd plug, I'd plug the idea of maybe a podcast or recording for people to listen to. Totally and I think for us like spacing things out a little bit more um, will be essential. I think we're, we're starting to get more and more requests um, and fairly since we likely won't be back for full events in the fall at this point. So I think uh, it's, you know, I think we'll just have to be deliberate about spacing things. Great, and not to be afraid to, to actually just keep it short. <laughs> you know, that's okay. <laughs> I think we're all afraid, seem to be very afraid of that, but it's fine if it's only half an hour or, or even less. And I don't know who, if a lot of you were on the, um, the first session with, when we did the AODA, but even having a, a 30 second, break in between to look away and just that everyone does at the same time I thought was really helpful. Absolutely. 
Uh, have any one of you hosted a large fair event yet? Uh, a booth style allowing one-to-one -one small group conversations, uh, a capacity of 100 external exhibitors and 2,000 plus student attendees. That would be a, a large scale event. We haven't done anything like that yet. Um, certainly looking into it and exploring the options of um, a, a larger event with breakout rooms and um, and that sort of thing, but we haven't actually executed it yet. Yeah, neither have we. I think this time period as well is of the summer. There aren't as many uh, there aren't as many students around, um, so it it might be something that is being looked into for the fall. I would say uh, and beyond. Yeah, we on our campus we've started to talk about it because we have a lot of amazing fairs and we're trying to think of platforms that exist. And one colleague brought up, uh, we haven't dug deeper yet, but I think it's called V, lowercase v fairs. Uh, and we have like a PDF of what they could offer. Um, so it sounds good, but we haven't done a deeper dive yet, but we might because that's one thing that we can share across our campus, maybe. Great, thank you. Um, next question. Has anyone used any particular platform successfully to transition networking reception style events to online? Uh, and specifically, has anyone transitioned like a speed networking style event to Quarkus for students yet? I like these questions. They might be topics for um, future webinars that we can we start getting more and more students uh, back uh, engaging with the with the university. I've been in a successful Zoom where uh, I think the, the facilities were able to know who the participants were, so they were able to kind of pre-plan the breakout room. So the flow of us going to our breakout room and coming back was just, it, I know it's hard in the back end, but it was seamless as a participant. And also Blackboard Collaborate was another good experience of like having the breakout and then coming back. Um, those were good moments for like having those little smaller networking and then larger ones. Any tips or ideas on hosting student orientation online and how to ideally have 20 organizations connect with a thousand students? I feel like that's the million dollar question and I'm on like three orientation and transition committees uh, to kind of help answer that. I think it'll be a mixture of live and pre-recorded. So elements such as like a welcome uh, maybe your message from your dean or principal, having maybe like a Zoom webinar type feel, and then smaller scale stuff that might be through Facebook or um, smaller Zoom, like breakout rooms for that more intimate connection as much as possible. Um, that's what I imagine. Emily, Jill, want to add in at all? I, I don't have much to add to this particular one, but I'm noticing in the chat that a hard house has hosted speed networking, so they may be able to provide some resources as well. And um, yeah, but in the, yeah, we haven't, we haven't, uh, we haven't broached that particular piece yet. Same, yeah. Well, this one's uh, directed to you. Do you have any advice in regards to hiring students to animate or facilitate online communities to foster social engagement? So I think um, there are some great examples. I this is something I definitely want to do more, and I know that other schools have have made good use of this and and are using student ambassadors for this piece. I know that our PCJ program, the Peace Conflict and Justice program, and Monk One within the Monk School have really used uh, students effectively to to maintain their social and sort of build communities online. Um, and if anyone's interested in that, I'm happy to connect you with Yona, who's the person who's overseeing that program and, and directing the work-study students. It's something we're trying to provide more resources for in the year ahead. So happy to chat about it offline if anyone wants to talk about it. But I'd also love to hear experiences from Nadia and Emily, if you have any. Can you repeat the question again? Is it about training using students for online? Yeah, it's about hiring students to animate or facilitate uh, online communities and fostering social engagement. Um, I guess what comes to mind is um, actually 
co-op too. Like I, I like there's some students that are, you know, there's like a decrease of co-op opportunities. So um, for us, we seek the few co-op positions to help with our online engagement where needed to kind of bolster that. Um, and these are really great work study opportunities for students that kind of want to be in this realm of online designing and, and networking. Uh, they have the skills, they're doing it through TikTok, they're doing it through Instagram, they're doing it amongst themselves. So I think the idea of getting paid to do it will be very appealing. Uh, but I think it's all in the training. So uh, making sure as you recruit students, training them on the platform, um, best practices, you know, your branding, that sort of thing, um, how to facilitate conversation, um, and then relying on hopefully their own skills and how they navigate the IT world. Great, thank you. All right, and conscious of time, um, and I'm sorry to everyone, I'm going to go a little bit over our, our uh, a lot of time here, but I'll take the last question. Any idea how many people you recommend having in the background, handling Zoom teams, Q&A, bringing on speakers for a research day event, so 300 attendees and no breakout sessions? I mean, just to speak for us and when we've had that number of people, usually we'll have two, potentially a third person, but usually someone handling the tech and someone sort of moderating and then maybe an additional sort of floater in the background, but. I would agree. And I think everyone who is on the back end, they should have a role <laughs> if they're there. Um, and so I think managing, depending on how many questions they anticipate coming in, but it can be quite a bit to manage it. So if you have one or two people managing that plus the tech and, um, and then being support for any panelists or, or whatnot is ideal. Great. Thank you. Um, so that will be our last answer. I apologize, we weren't able to get through everyone's questions. Um, we ran out of time, but hopefully some of these questions will be addressed in uh, future sessions for the main event. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us here today. I know it's a time of great uncertainty and high, high stress, and we're truly appreciative of, all, of your participation. I hope you found it as insightful as I did. Uh, a special thank you to Jillian, Emily, and Nadia for your leadership and dedication to the university and for sharing your experiences with us today. I know it's been a learning experience in many ways for us all. Uh, another special thank you to the organizing committee for putting on this series of webinars on tri-campus events at the University of Toronto. I hope you'll all join us for the third main event webinar on the topic of using Zoom to host webinars, meetings, and events, optimizing the experiences for your clients and guests, and that's scheduled for Thursday, June 18th from 10.30 to 11.30 on Zoom. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone, and I wish you and your families the very best. Thank you. Bye.